Welcome back to Sought Out Ministries. Pastor Cheryl Curry. Hallelujah. We're going to be going to the Word of God. Amen. We're going to be going to the Word of God. Amen. Getting God good. Brother Ron, can you help me out, please? Getting God good. I'm telling you. He woke you up this morning, did he not? No, your alarm clock did not wake you up. Uh -huh, because the many alarm clocks have gone up, no doubt, in the world system, but nobody stirred. Hmm? Do you know that can happen? Uh huh. That can happen. Somebody said, but God. but God. Amen. But God. But God. But God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We're looking today, somebody, at. Um, we're back on this series, amen, writing out relationships God's way. We're back on the series. Amen. We're back on the series of writing out relationships God's way. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Writing out relationships God's way. Amen. And so um, we're looking at relational skills. Relational skills. Getting along with people and, and, and how we do that God's way. Amen. And... Um, this, this series, somebody, uh, is about the relational skills, getting along with people, mm, that none of us learn early on. Mm -hmm. And today we're talking about the, I've changed the subject from, from your outline, I've changed the title, mm -hmm. but it's okay, it's the same substance, amen? The love of your life, what nobody told you. I'm changing it to the love of your life, what nobody told you, amen? It's okay. And so it's the same substance, amen? But, uh, you know, none of our parents uh, taught us uh, these things, and, and school certainly didn't teach us these things. Is that right? We learned calculus and algebra. You know, I don't know where I, I, I use calcula, calculus and, and algebra. I don't know where I learned that, okay? I mean, where I use that. But they taught me that in school, uh, but I don't know where I use that at. I don't think anywhere. Nevertheless, you can use this word, amen? But we started the series off with six mistakes. Six mistakes that wise people never make in relationships. And we looked at the Bible there, the book of James, amen? And then we looked at what the Bible says about how to not let people push uh, our buttons and how not to get hooked into their anger. Is that right? And then we looked at uh, how to resolve conflict and there's seven biblical steps for resolving conflict. Amen? And then we looked at how to build healthy boundaries. Amen? So we should be growing in our relationships. Is that right? We should be growing now. Amen? Today we're going to look at how to choose the right person for marriage. As this can save you a lot of pain. The love of your life, what nobody told you. Amen? It's going to bless you. Now, in your life, somebody, there are two, uh, mo two of the most important choices you, that you ever have to make in your life. The two choices, most important choices you'll have to make in your life, the two very most important ones you ever have to make in your life. And one is, will I ever get married? And that's a choice. And the other is, if I do get married, who do I get married to? Amen? Now, Proverbs chapter 12 Verse 26, we see that on our outline, Proverbs 12 and 26. And the word of God there says, the righteous chooses his friends carefully. The righteous chooses his friends carefully. Amen? Now know this. Now if you're supposed to choose your friends carefully, then you should even be more careful about choosing your life partner. Don't you think? If you got to choose your friends carefully, don't you think we should choose our life partner even carefully, even more carefully than that? Amen. And so, yeah, it is a choice. It's a choice. It's a choice. Because you get to choose. It's a choose your friends. You get to choose, okay? Choose your friends. God does not choose your life partner for you. God does not choose your life partner for you, okay? Now, God says, you make that choice. You make that choice, okay? 
The word of God again says there at Proverbs chapter 12, verse 26, in the English Standard Version, it says there, the righteous chooses his friends carefully. The righteous chooses his friends carefully. Amen? Know this. The problem, problem is here, though, that is that nobody teaches us how to, how to choose our friends. Nobody teaches us how to choose a life partner, do they? Anybody ever taught you that? Nobody teaches us this, but it's the most important uh, decision you have to make in life. But nobody teaches us that. Is that right? I've never even heard a word on it. Amen? But know this. Uh, you didn't get a class on this in school, did you? Hmm? Uh, your parents didn't teach you how to choose the right person to marry? Huh? And so as a result, many people end up in the wrong marriage for the wrong reasons, okay? And my prayer is, if you're single, I don't want you to end up in the wrong marriage for the wrong reasons, amen? It's a, you need to learn this. Even if you're married, you can actually get something out of this today, amen? But we will look at what the Bible says is God's checklist for choosing the right person as a life partner. Hmm? But before we do that, I need to actually get rid of a couple of myths, a couple of myths. The first correction of a myth is that, the correction is that God does not choose your mate for you. Many people think that God has to choose my mate for me. But no, it's your decision, it's your choice, it's your choice, amen? God is not gonna choose your mate for you, okay? God places the responsibility 100% on your shoulders. Amen? And so God is not going to put a sign in the sky that says, marry, marry Harry, marry Harry. <laughs> You're not going to do that, okay? I thank God for you and Harry. But it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Amen? Now, some people say, well, I'm just not going to date. I'm just going to wait. There's a word for that. It's called bachelor, a bachelorette. I never married. Okay? When God wants somebody to steer you, it's easier to move, it's easier than to steer a moving car than it is a parked car. Right? It's easier to steer a, part, uh, a moving car than a parked car. And so it's got to be moving. It's got to be moving. So uh, if it's moving, you know, then it can go this way or it can go that way. Is it right? So you could, go, you could go home and sit in your recliner and say, well, I'm just going to wait. I'm just going to wait. I'm not going to date. I'm just going to wait on God. Okay? You're going to be there waiting because nothing is going to happen. Okay? Good stuff, right? Good stuff today. God says it's your choice. It's your choice. It's your choice. God leads us. He guides us. And he gives us guidelines. But ultimately, it's your choice. Amen? The second correction of a myth is this, that there's only one person for me. That's the myth. There's only one person for me. That's, very, that's, that's not true. That is not true. That is not true. That is not true. That thought is very romantic. Isn't that very romantic that you, that you, you come into where you, the place where the one that's just for you finds you? Isn't that romantic? That makes a beautiful, beautiful story, does it not? What a movie. What a movie. Okay? And so... Uh, you, you say, well, there's only one person in the universe for me. Uh, that's not true. There's not just one person in the universe for you. That's not true. It's romantic, but it's not biblical. Amen? And it's not only not biblical, it's not even logical. Because if there was only one right person for everybody in the whole wide world, it would take one person to make a crucial mistake and get the wrong person, then that would throw everybody else in the whole world off. And they couldn't be married to the right person either. So that's not even logical, that there's only one person for, for a person in the whole wide world. That's not true. It's not logical. So let's say uh, I was supposed to marry uh, a man named Jim. But instead I married a brother Ron. Hmm? Then all of a sudden, that would upset it would upset, you know, ups, actually upset somebody the apple cart. It would upset somebody uh, the chain for everybody else on the entire earth. 
<coughs> is that right? <coughs> so it's a total myth. Are you supposed to marry one person in the universe that God picked out? That's a myth. It's very romantic, but it's not true. Amen? Now in your life, somebody, there are multiple people, multiple people, that God will say it's okay for you to get married to. Multiple people. Okay? There would be millions that he would say, no, 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 you can't marry. No, no. There would be millions that God would say, no, don't marry that one. No, not, not millions. Okay? But there are multiple people that God says it's okay for you to marry that person. All right? And so now, but it's your choice. It's your preference. It's your choice. Amen? So God does not just have one person for you when it comes to marriage. Amen? So forget that there's some Mr. Right, um, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Mrs. Right, uh, Mr. Right. That's not the case. It's not the case. They're just not there. Amen? So it's not, it is not going to happen that way. And the Bible does not say that there's just one person for you on earth. We got that clear? So there's one more myth that's not in your outline, one more myth. And that is that, um, just write this down. Your first, the first thing in your outline is that God does not choose your mate for you. That's your first thing in your outline. The second thing in your outline is there isn't only one right person for me. The third thing on your outline that you got to just put in, fill in, is that love alone is not enough reason to get married. Two people get together and, you know, uh, the family background may not be right. Or the spiritual background may not be right. And the personality uh, background is not right. Uh, the educational background may not be right. Uh, maybe the other person does not have, have the same energy as you do. Or maybe the other person does not have the same amount of ambition that you do. Uh, maybe they don't even have the same values and goals that you do. And so, uh, but you say, well, none of these things matter. We love each other. Mm. Well, let me tell you this. Given the right situation, you could fall in love with anybody. Given the right situation. And uh, given that you have a, um, you have a, a Two weeks together uh, in Hawaii, mm -hmm. uh, you probably could fall in love. Okay? Mm -hmm. But love is a choice. Love is a choice because you got to come home from Hawaii. <laughs> you can't stay over there, amen? And so just because you love somebody does not mean you should marry them. Have you ever heard that? Say that with me. Just because I love somebody. Doesn't mean I ought to marry him. You can fall in love with all kinds of people, but that does not mean you should, you should marry them because uh, love is not enough. Love is not enough. You've got to have to live with this person. Amen? It takes a lot of other things to account, to bring it to account. That's where we're going to look at in, in this word. That's what we're going to look at in this word. Amen? So God does not tell you who to marry. God does not tell you who to marry. Amen? But he does give you a description, a description of the kind of person that he desires for you to marry. Okay? So know this, that if you want God's blessing, if you want God's protection, if you want God's success in your marriage, then you better listen to what God has to say about what kind of person you should marry. Amen? The evidence of not following what God says to do is all around us. The evidence of not following what God says to do is all around us. Amen? God gives us a list. He gives us a list. Amen? We're called this list uh, the list of must-haves. The list of must-haves. This is a list of things from the Bible that you must have in your life and in your mate's life your boyfriend or girlfriend's life, in order to marry them. Until these things are right, you're not ready to marry them, and they're not ready to marry you. Amen? Now, they've been, they may not ever be ready to marry you, or you may not be ready to marry them ever, okay? And so, but know this. You can add this to your list of things, because this list is the bare minimum of things that are uh, uh, that God actually blesses in a marriage. 
Amen? So if your girlfriend or boyfriend, somebody does not meet these qualifications, deal breaker. Deal breaker. You might as well push the button. Deal breaker. Amen? So I don't care how much you love them. I don't care how much money they have, how, how cute they are, how much they make you laugh, okay? Doesn't matter how sweet you guys, both of you guys get along together, how much fun y'all have together. If you don't match on the following things, it's a deal breaker. Hmm? So I just want to save you some pain in life because these are not my opinions. These, somebody, are what God says are the requirements of the kind of person you should choose to marry. Amen? The first thing we have is uh, your husband or wife must have spiritual, you and your husband and wife, you, you, your husband and wife or your partner must have spiritual unity. You must have spiritual unity. Spiritual unity. Can you say that? Spiritual unity. And so that's the number one qualification. Both of you guys must have together spiritual unity. Amen? That means you both believe the same thing about God. Okay? You both have a relationship with God. Amen? And uh, if you're not spiritually unified with your spouse, you're never going to enjoy the depth of physical intimacy, uh, sexual intimacy, or emotional intimacy that God desires for your marriage. Amen? So you cannot have the ultimate physical, emotional, and sexual unity that God wants you to have if you're not unified in that one area, your relationship with God. Your relationship with God, amen? Your relationship somebody to God should be the biggest, most important part of your entire life. Amen? If you cannot share the biggest, most important part of your life with your spouse, then both of you are living on different wavelengths. Okay, if you don't have spiritual unity, somebody, you've got different worldviews. You see the world in different ways. Amen? You may have all kind of other things in common, but your marriage will be superficial, won't be deep. It'll be superficial on the surface. It won't have a level of, of depth and character and understanding that it should have or could have. And it will go that way your entire lives if you don't have that spiritual unity. Amen? I'm just saying that if you don't have that spiritual unity, uh, your marriage will be shallow. There will be problems. Your marriage will never be as deep as it could be. You will never experience the emotional intimacy or even the sexual intimacy, uh, or emotional intimacy, that uh, physical in intimacy that uh, God wants you to share with each other, amen? Because you're not united in spirit. Because you're not united in spirit, amen? Now, if you want God's protection on your marriage, if you want God's blessing on your marriage, then God has to be at the center. God has to be at the center, amen? He's got to be the glue. He's got to be the glue. Now, most people, somebody have no idea how important God is to a marriage. Most people have no idea because it takes more than a man and a woman to make a marriage. Amen? Remember, somebody, that marriage is God's idea. God thought marriage up. God thought marriage up. God thought up sex. Amen? God thought up intimacy. Huh? God thought up family and children. God, those are all God's thoughts. He thought all those things up. So God designed all these things, amen? God designed a marriage, somebody, that is a three-legged stool. God designed a marriage that is a three-legged stool. God, a husband, and a wife, three legs. Amen? You take out any one of these legs now, and the stool is going to fall over. Okay? A one-legged stool will fall over, will it not? Try it. It'll happen. A two-legged stool will fall over, will it not? It'll just fall over, will it not? But a three-legged stool will stand. Huh? Because God has to be at the center of that marriage. If God is not at the center of that marriage, it's going to fall. Hmm? 
You've got to have God in the relationship or it's going to be unstable. Mm -hmm. If God is not in that marriage, it's going, be, it's going to be knocked over in big ways, in all different kind of ways. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Know this. God, somebody is absolutely clear about this first must have. Let's look at some verses here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 14 through 15, in the uh, God's Word translation. God's Word translation. It says there, stop forming inappropriate relationships with unbelievers. Can right and wrong be partners? Can light have anything in common with darkness? Can a believer share life with an unbeliever? I think you already know the answer to that, don't you? You know what God says, don't you? Well, imagine Lily. You don't know Lily. I know Lily. Lily comes to me, and she starts telling me all the fine qualities of her fiancé. This just happened, and she's telling me how great he is. How great he is, how great he is. Okay. But Lily's fiance does actually have a lot of fine qualities, and Lily loves him. Well, Lily and her fiance have a lot in common. They do. They have similar plans, you know, for life, and, and they think alike in a lot of different areas. It's looking good, isn't it? It's looking really, really good. There's only one problem. Lily's fiancé is not a believer. He's, he's an unbeliever. Hmm? I would be remiss, negligent, neglectful, and disobedient to God if I did not say, Lily, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. I love you. I don't, I don't want you to make this mistake. Because if you don't have spiritual unity, you're never going to have sexual unity or emotional unity the way God intended. Hmm? You're never going to have emotional unity the way God intended sexually, physical, any kind of intimacy, intimacy whatsoever. You're not going to have it. You're never going to have uh, unity in your communication because the biggest area of your life, your partner rejects. You see, God has a way about, God says something here about marriages. What about that? If you have committed your life to Jesus Christ, there is no way you can give your life away to somebody else who rejects your Savior. Can you? Can you give up your Savior for another human being? That ain't happening. You can go ahead and get married to an unbeliever. You can say, well, God, I, I don't want your blessings. I don't want your protection. God, I don't want your um, success in my marriage. I'm going to willfully ignore what the Bible says because, God, I love, I love Jimmy. Okay. Well, know this. A lot of females, when they plan their wedding, they adhere to a standard when it comes to their, their wedding event. There's a certain standard that wedding event has to meet, okay? I mean, you know, you walk down the aisle, is that right? You stand at the altar, uh-huh, and they do a hymn, they do the hymn, okay? And, and then you have it. There's the aisle, there's the altar, there's the hymn, and people think that's how, that's how it's going to be in marriage. Aisle, altar, hymn. I'll alter him. You can't alter him. You can't change him. You get it? You can't change him. You can't alter him. Hmm? It doesn't work that way. They think I'm going to walk down the aisle, come to the altar, sing a hymn, and I'll alter him. We'll be, we'll be happily married and raptured. Not so. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. And the word of God there says, in the New English Bible, it says there, do not unite yourself with an unbeliever. There are not fit mates for you. Do not unite yourself with an unbeliever. There are not fit mates for you. What about that? Well, if you want God's best, 
I'm telling you, I'm telling you right up front, if you want God's best, somebody, don't even consider somebody who's not committed to Jesus Christ if you want God's best. Don't even consider somebody who's not committed to Jesus Christ. Amen? Let me give you the hard, cold facts of life. National survey reported in Marriage Magazine, one out of every two and a half marriages in America now ends in divorce. Okay? That's not a very good odds. One out of, one out of every two and a half marriages end in divorce. That's not a very good odds. Not very good odds at all. But when this couple now is spiritually united, spiritually unified, they are both believers, okay, and they practice three habits together. They attend church together weekly. They pray together. They read the Bible together. The divorce rate then drops from one out of every two and a half marriages to actually one out of every 1,500 marriages. Are you willing to take a gamble? Are you willing to gamble? Say, well, I'm just going to gamble and see what, what, turns, what it turns out to be. Okay, be careful about that. I don't recommend it. So this is a starting point here for, for actually the love of your life and what nobody told you. This is a starting point. You must have spiritual unity. You must have spiritual unity, amen? The Bible says this in Romans chapter 1, verse 12, in the New Century Version. It says this there. It says there, Romans chapter 12. I'm sorry, Romans chapter 1, verse 12, New Century Version. It says there, I want us to help each other with the faith we have. Your faith will help me, and my faith will help you. Romans chapter 1, verse 12 New century version, amen? Now know this, that this is what God wants, uh, wants to do in marriage. He wants to have the faith of the husband help the wife, and the faith of the wife help the husband. You see how it happens? I say the faith of the husband help the wife, and the faith of the wife help the husband. That's how that works, amen? Now how can your faith Help each other if one of you has no faith. That's why God says don't marry an unbeliever. Because if one of you has no faith, an unbeliever has no faith. Is that right? So if one of you has no faith, how can you help each other? You can't help each other. Is that right? You cannot help each other. So know this. If I were to stand here on the edge of the pulpit, okay, and I said, well, um, Sister Lily, uh, come up here, please. And... um. I'm going to actually, um, I'm going to pull you up here to the pulpit. You, I've, you've seen me do this before, years ago. I'm going to pull you up here on the pulpit. It's always easier for somebody to be pulled down in a relationship than it is to pull somebody else up. Because the Word of God says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 33, evil communications corrupt good manners. Okay? In other words, if you're habitually around somebody all the time and they're not following God, they're not, well, they're not a believer and they're not following God, they can pull you, even though you're a believer, you, they can pull you down and make you lose your Jesus instead of you pulling them up. You hear me? So don't think you can alter somebody once you get married to them. That doesn't work that way. You hear me? <laughs> you hear me? Doesn't work that way. The married women say Amen. I didn't hear you, married women. Amen. Amen. Spiritual unity, somebody, is still uh, not enough. If somebody is already married to an unbeliever, you love them, all you do now is just love them, and you pray that they come to Christ. Amen. If you're already married to an unbeliever, then you, you love them and pray that they come to Christ. Amen? That's what you do. Now, if you have any questions about how to pray, um, for your unbelieving husband or wife, DM me, DM me a, a message via Messenger uh, privately and I'll help you with that, okay? Now, the second non-negotiable in choosing a life partner uh, is that we must not only have spiritual unity, but we also must have life purpose compatibility. We must also have life purpose compatibility, C-O-M-P-A-T-I-B-I-L-I-T-Y, compatibility, amen? 
we must have life purpose compatibility. Let's talk about what that is. We have to be headed somebody in the same direction. Well, our life purpose must be headed in the same direction, amen? In the same direction. Uh, we have to be headed in, this, uh, in the same direction for somebody for the same reason and for the same purpose in life. Amen? The Bible says this in Amos chapter 3 and 3, New Living Translation, can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? Can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? Now know this, the answer to that is no. Because you can't want to walk that way, and then your partner want to walk this way, because you're going in opposite directions. Is that right? Yeah. And so know this, if two people cannot walk together without the same purpose, how are they going to live together in intimacy? Hmm? It is not going to happen. The marriage is going to fall apart. It's going to fall apart. If you have a purpose for your life that goes that way, and I have a purpose for my life that goes this way, then the relationship that is not going to last. It's going to end in disaster. There's going to be a life of conflict because each of you are going in different directions. What about that? Hmm? Now, the meaning, the underlying meaning, somebody, of this is if you're not ready to marry, well, let me just say this. The underlying meaning of this is that you're not ready to marry until you know your life purpose. You're not really ready to marry until you know what God put you here for. What your life purpose is. Have you guys been asking God, what is my life purpose? Amen. Oh, he has a way of letting you know. Don't you worry. You'll look back one day, he'll give you a dream, whatever. However he decides to do it, you will know. Amen. And know that when he gives you your life purpose, you're going to be quite scared. It's going to scare you. Because you know you can't do it in and of your own strength. You can't do it by yourself. It's going to, have to, it's going to take Jesus walking with you in your life to get it done. So you're going to need Jesus. And so know this, somebody, that now, you got to say, well, like I said, you got to identify your purpose. What is your calling? What did God call you here on this earth to do? Everybody has a purpose. Everybody has a purpose. You may not have any money, but you do have a purpose. Huh? Everybody has a purpose, okay? Now, why did God put you here on the earth? Why did God put you here on the earth? Until you know that question, somebody, don't even think about getting married. Because you don't want to marry somebody who's going in the opposite direction, okay, to hinder your purpose. Got it? Mm hmm So you're married to somebody whose purpose is totally different. It's, it's what's going to happen if you just run ahead and go on and, and not know your own purpose. But you're going to be married to somebody who's totally different, okay? But God put you here, somebody, for a purpose. Amen? God did three things for you. He created you. He shaped you. He created you. He gifted you. And he called you. He created you or shaped you into a certain mold that he wants you to walk in. He gifted you with the gift. And he called you to do a work for him on the earth. You know, that's why we're here. That's why none of us are dead that are here today. It's because that we're still walking in God's will for our lives. We're still walking in God's purpose for our lives. We're not finished. Amen? And if you, if you have not been walking in God's purpose, then, um, and if you don't even know Christ, have not received him into your heart, uh, that's a whole other issue there because uh, anything goes. Anything goes. Amen? So, but God created you. Look at Ephesians chapter 2.10. God created you, amen? God created you. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10. It says there, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. 
Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 in the NIV. Did you see that part? Circle in, circle in advance, in advance. Circle that part in advance. And let's read it again. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared, prepared, prepared in advance for us to do. Now, did you know that before you were born, God had already decided your life purpose before you were ever born? Mm -hmm. He prepared in advance the things he wanted you to do with your life. So we need to be asking God, God, is this what you want me to do? If you're already doing something, ask God, God, is this what you want me to do? Because if it's not what God wants you to do, guess what? It won't work. Amen? It's not, I'm not saying that it'll be hard. It will be hard still. But I'm saying you will actually have success at it over time. But know this, know this, know this, that one day you're going to stand before God. Amen? He's going to ask you two questions. But the nice thing about God is he tells us what's on the final exam before we ever get to the exam. Uh, and so uh, there are only two questions on the exam. Hmm? And because God wants you to pass it the first time, he, he actually, actually gives you the, uh, the questions in advance, ahead of time. Hmm? And one day you're going to die. I'm going to get to that. But one day you're going to die. One day your heart will stop beating. And that's going to be the end of your body. But it's not going to be the end of you. Because you were made to live forever. Amen? It's not the end of you. you you're made to live forever. Your spirit goes to be with God. The real you. What makes you laugh, your personality, who you are. But you're going to live forever in one of two places. You were made, you were made as believers. You were made for a long-term relationship with God. A long-term relationship with God. Amen? And God wants you in heaven. He wants you in heaven. Amen? But that's why he sent his son somebody to die for you on the cross. So heaven would be possible. Amen? Now one day you will stand before God... He's going to ask you first, what did you do with my son Jesus? What did you do with my son Jesus? What do you do with him? Hmm. I hope you know the answer to that. Do you know what you did with Jesus? Hmm. You know the answer? You received him. And then you tell him that you got baptized on the 25th of April, 2021. Amen? Tell him that. Amen? Now, he's not going to ask you, though, were you Catholic, were you Baptist, were you Pentecostal? He's not going to ask you the nomination. Amen? He's just going to say, what did you do with my son Jesus? Huh? Can you answer that, anybody? And then he's going to ask the second question. What did you do with what I gave you? Because I put a gift on your life. What did you do with what I gave you? What did you do with what I gave you? Because you've been given certain gifts, talents, abilities, certain purposes. You've been given a certain bit, a certain way that uh, uh, things you're good at in life. God wired you with all of these things, okay? So your spiritual gifts, he gave you those. Hmm? He gave you your spiritual desires. Your ability, your personality, your experiences. And he wants you to use these to, to the max. He wants you to fulfill your purpose by using these. Amen, somebody? When you stand before God one day, God is not going to say, who did you marry? He's going to say, did you fulfill your purpose? Did you walk in your purpose? Mm -hmm. Now, are you going to say, well, no, sorry, Lord, I, I wasn't able to get to that because uh, there was a cutie that I was talking to and uh, I didn't get to that cutie. I mean, I didn't get to your, your, your purpose and everything because she was so cute. He was, he was good looking. He was fine. 
I, I, Lord, I just didn't, I didn't, I didn't get around to that. Well, that's not the answer. Wrong. Because God called you. He called you. God said, I designed you. I shaped you in advance for what I made you to do. That's why you think the way you think. Uh huh. That's why I don't think like you and you don't think like me. Because my purpose is different than yours. Huh? Uh, that's, why you, uh, that's why you feel the way you feel about certain things. Because God put that in you. Help me, Holy Spirit. God put that in you, amen, to be different. God put that in you as part of your, as part of your purpose. Amen? My husband likes to say that I like pitiful movies. Well, I don't look at Lifetime uh, because they're all pitiful, but I don't, like it. I don't like them that much. But I do like, I do like to see um, things or people are going through something God, because I, I want to um, jump to it. I want to figure it out. That's just me. Okay? Uh, that's my social work thingy in me. That's what God had me go to social work school and get my master's in social work and let me have a free ride because that was my bent. That's what he put in me. Amen? That's what he put in me. Isn't God good? He knows in advance what we need. Is that right? Now, my husband is more analytical, especially with numbers. Well, I couldn't care less about numbers, but I can add and subtract and divide. You know what I'm saying? But I, I don't mean, come on. I don't care all that much about it. I have called him when he was working. I have called him and said, oh, baby, I'm working on my job, and I need you to help me with this, this right here. And he's trying to do his job and help me with my percentages. Okay, I mean, okay, really, I'm not, okay, whatever. <laughs> that's his, that's, it. God put that in him, but I don't have it in me. But together I got both because I can get the percentages out of him because I'm married to him. Amen, and he can, get, he can get the personal thing and the people thing out of me uh, because I got that in me. What about that? So now together we got, we got a team. We can get things done. That's how God does it. That's how God does it. And so now I'm just saying here, now, God, not only somebody designed and created you and gifted you, 1 Peter 4 says this. 1 Peter 4, chapter 10, 1 Peter 4, verse 10, New Century Version says this. Each of you has received a gift from God for serving others. Now you must be faithful to develop and use that gracious gift from God. So see, you do have a gift from God for serving others. Now you must be faithful to develop and use that gracious gift from God. Amen? Let's talk about it. You know, you, uh, you've got to be faithful, amen, to use the gift God put in you. You've got to be faithful to do that, amen? Uh, because God put it, in you to, put it in you to help people, is that right? Now, if you've got a life partner, somebody, uh, who does not care about God's gifts, or they have a, um, they're going in a different direction. Um, well, well, first of all, your life partner does not care about God's gifts, and they're going in a different direction. Then, how are the gifts going to be used? How are your gifts going to be used in that marriage? You see what I'm saying? To the max. You see? God not only is somebody created and designed and gifted you, He has called you. He's called you. Do you know somebody that you're called? Every Christian is called by God. Every Christian is called by God. The Bible says that marriage is a partnership to fulfill your calling. Marriage is a partnership to fulfill your calling. Look at Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Hebrews 3, verse 1a, part of that particular verse, in the God's Word translation says this, Brothers and sisters, you are holy partners in a heavenly calling. Okay? Now, let me tell you this. If you've got a, a girlfriend, you're a boy, you got a girlfriend, you girl, you got a girl, you got a boyfriend, and you're not, if you know, you already know you're not going to be more effective in walking in your purpose, fulfilling your purpose, married. If you already know with a girlfriend or boyfriend you have, if you're a girl or boy, you already know with that girlfriend or boyfriend you have, that you're not going to be more effective fulfilling your purpose married, then you better stay unmarried. 
Because life is about fulfilling your purpose that God is putting you to fulfill. Amen? You hear me? Mm-hmm. Amen? Okay, you got that? Now, know this. The purpose of marrying somebody is to make you more effective in fulfilling your purpose. The purpose of marriage is to make you more uh, effective in fulfilling your purpose. That's the purpose of marriage. You put big stars by that. That's the purpose of marriage, to make you more effective in fulfilling your purpose. Amen? What about that? Mm -hmm. Now, if, if marriage somebody, purpose of marriage somebody is to keep you, is to make you, is to, the purpose of marriage is to make you more effective in fulfilling your purpose. Amen? Now, if marriage keeps you from your purpose, then you've missed the point of marriage. Mm hmm Because you're, to be, you're supposed to be partners in God's calling. You're supposed to be partners in God's calling. Amen? So here's what you need to do. Picture in your mind your life purpose uh, as a circle. Put, like, put a circle even on your paper and draw you on your paper uh, doing God's purpose for your life. You know God's purpose for your life? If you've got an inkling about it, uh, write it in your, in your circle or draw it in your circle. Amen? Mm hmm <laughs> Little exercise. Now, uh, picture in your mind, picture in your mind now the life purpose of the person that you're considering to marry. You're considering to marry, or maybe even that you're already married. Picture the life person, the life purpose of the person that you're married to or are or, or considering marrying. Okay? If you don't have one, wait, which is a good thing. <laughs> now, if, you, if you've done that, you can do that. Do those two pictures overlap? Can they overlap? Like, um, thank God for Brother Ron. He knows numbers. Thank God for that. He loves people and he knows numbers. Amen? And so, but we walk together in ministry. Is that right? So I depend on him for the numbers. Amen? Amen? And uh, I offer to him, amen, uh, the spiritual part. What about that? Is that right? Know this. Now, you have to have, when the, when the two circles can overlap, that's oneness. When the two circles can overlap, that's God. Amen? When you have two different purposes, you have no impact. Because uh, two are better than one. The Bible says two are better than one. Is that right? Because you have a great return for what you do. But if you have two different purposes, then you have no impact. Two different purposes, no impact. Okay? And not only that, when you have two different purposes, you have less joy. When you have two different purposes, somebody, you have uh, greater conflict. Uh-huh. So let's summarize for today because that's where we're going to stop. Uh, you, you not only have to have, uh, in your relationship, looking at marriage, uh, you not only must have spiritual unity, but you must have the same life purpose in life. The same life purpose in life. You love children. I know your purpose must deal with children. I think. I don't know. She said. She looked behind her. Okay. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Real talk. But God gifted you, everybody. He designed you and he called you. Is that right? You may uh, both be fine people, and you both may uh, love the Lord, and you may love each other, but that does not mean you should get married. You've got to ask, do we have the same purpose? Do we have the same purpose? What about that? 
So you got to think about it. Amen? We're going to finish this particular word up. Amen? The love of your life, what nobody told you, or love in marriage, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm going to pick this up on next Sunday and finish it next Sunday. Amen? Lord willing. Uh, but join me, Facebook Live, for um, a word on Thursday uh, to encourage you. Amen? Facebook Live at 7 o'clock p.m. Thursday. Thank you for joining us today. Be blessed. Be blessed. Be blessed. Bye-bye.